Thank you very much. Uh, very, uh, thank you for the invitation to come here. This is uh, great. I'm glad everybody, so many people turned out at 7.30 on a, a weeknight. Um, so I just thought, uh, since I was visiting Yellowknife, I've never been here before, I thought it would be great to uh, speak about some of the work I've been doing looking at global patterns in lake warming. I thought there might be some interest in the, in the topic, especially considering uh, the heightened interest in climate change in this region. So I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about that work and also a little bit about the work I've done in a cold northern lake uh, across the globe in Russia. But I think there's some things we could learn uh, from that lake as well uh, for things happening here in the north. So um, as I mentioned, we're living in this era of environmental change. Uh, we're seeing uh, rising air temperatures, we're seeing declines in sea ice levels, um, and we're seeing melting permafrost. And I think everybody here um, who, who lives in the Northwest Territories is probably pretty familiar with those, um, those things that are happening. But one of my questions is, you know, how do we understand what these processes are going to do to the things living in these systems or the animals that depend on um, our water resources and other things that might be impacted by climate change? And so that's, uh, as a biologist, that's what I'm interested in most, is not just is the temperature warming one degree or two degrees, but what does that mean for us? What does that mean for um, animals that live in these environments? And so I won't uh, bore you with the details of all of this, but just to highlight, this is data from NASA. And every time I look at these graphs, it always amazes me um, to see the patterns over long time scales and how the Earth is changing. So just to look at this uh, graph on the left here, this is looking at carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere. And this is thousands of years before today. And often people who are skeptics of climate change, they'll say, oh, CO2 levels have fluctuated. Uh, they always fluctuate over the course of the Earth's history. And they're right. They do go up and down. And what's interesting is usually when they peak, these are the warmest periods of our Earth's history, or we call it the interglacial periods. When CO2 levels are very low, that's when we have uh, periods where glaciers extend uh, across the landscape. So this shows you periods, in three interglacial periods here. Here is, right here, zero is 1950, so we're here in our century, close to our century. And if you follow that line up, the current CO2 level is way up here. Um, so if you look at the highest historical CO2 levels, we're far exceeding that. And just to look at that graph, it always amazes me um, that we're able to surpass that historical level. So today, the, the latest data, it's at 404 parts per million. So it's, you know, at the top of this graph today. And then if you look at the right, this is a temperature compared to, you know, scientists like to set a benchmark or a standard. And NASA chose uh, the time period between 1950 and 1980 for a standard. And what that means is any value below zero here is lower than the average temperature between 1950 and 1980. Any level, anything above zero is higher. And so when you look at this, you can see that, uh, you know, 100 years ago or more, we were below that average and it steadily climbed. And when you look at the 10 warmest years on record, they have all been since uh, the year 2000. So it's pretty amazing to think all of, our, all of our warmest years have been within the last couple decades. And then finally, just to convince you a little bit more, is if you look at a uh, million square kilometers of sea ice in the Arctic, and you look at the trends from 1980 to today, you can see there's fluctuations year to year, but it's definitely at a lower level than it was. So, you know, all of these things are just to to kind of convince you, if you weren't already convinced, that there, we are in an, in an era of environmental change. So I mentioned I would talk about two things. Uh, part one, I just wanted to present some studies on warming of the world's lakes. And then part two, I'll talk about uh, impacts of long-term warming in a, a cold northern lake, like Baikal in Russia. So, um, 
you might have, you know, if you've ever read the uh, paper or news articles, you might have heard that some lakes are warming. But the question was, are all lakes warming across the globe? What are the patterns? Are there some regions that are warming faster than others? Um, so there was evidence, of course, that waters are warming, but we just haven't looked at across the globe, tried to figure out the patterns. So we had this question, are lakes warming globally? And I cannot take credit for all of this work at all. I worked with a large group of scientists called the Global Lake Temperature Collaboration. It was funded by NASA and the National Science Foundation. And what we were trying to do is um, basically pull every scientist we could contact and ask them, hey, do you have temperature data for a lake in your country or, you know, in your province or whatever it happened to be? And do you have a time series of data? So do you have data going back 10 or 20 years on lake temperatures? And if they did, then we invited them to join us and share their data with the idea of looking at how are lake temperatures changing across the globe. And so there's a couple ways to collect this temperature data. Uh, we ended up with over 250 lakes around the world. And the mean length of these series was about 22 years. So for each lake, um, you know, say we were looking at Great Slave Lake, we would have about um, 20 years worth of data uh, on surface temperatures throughout the, the, this time series. And there were different ways these data were collected. One is just people going out on a boat. Maybe they had a research program, they'd go out whenever uh, the water was clear in the summer, and they'd take temperature measurements. So we called that in situ or in place measurements. Uh, the other way is in some places, like Great Slave Lake has buoys like this, there's automated temperature systems. The buoys float there and they measure what they call the sea surface temperature. And so we could get that data as well. But there's only so many lakes in the world where somebody's either going out on a boat or they've deployed these expensive buoy systems, these automatic systems. Um, so another way around that is to use um, remote sensing or satellites. And that's why NASA got involved with this, is they have some uh, pretty cool satellites that orbit the Earth uh, at different speeds, depending on their orbit. And as they pass over the Earth's surface, they have instruments on them that can actually measure the temperatures of the lakes, so of the lake's surface. So for example, this is Lake Tahoe, and um, you can actually see across the lake differences in the lake temperature. I always think that's incredibly cool to look at it. You often think of a lake being homogeneous or the same across the surface, but when you actually look at that, there's cool spots and warm spots. And so these satellites are another way that we could look at summer uh, water temperatures and get a bigger data set. So we didn't just have to depend on uh, individuals going out and collecting the data. So 128 of our lakes were collected this way, the temperatures, and the rest of the 250 were collected by manual methods. And this is what we ended up with. I hope you guys can see the dots on the map. Um, the kind of pink ones here are in situ, meaning somebody took a boat out or they deployed a buoy. And so those are all the lake locations. And you'll notice those are pretty concentrated. They would be in North America, Western Europe. So that's where there's a lot of researchers. There's research programs that collect that data. Um, all of the green spots are satellites. So that's, that's where the surface temperatures were measured by satellites. Together, these lakes hold more than half of the Earth's fresh water. So it's a pretty um, important st study in, in the case that it's representing a lot of our fresh water on our planet. And so when you look at these lakes and you try and look at how fast or slow they're warming, uh, what these colors tell you is if it's a blue color, it means the lake is cooling. If it's an orange to red color, it's warming. So over the past several decades, these are the trends. And so if it's you know, a very red color, it might mean it's warming about uh, 1.3 degrees Celsius per decade, every 10 years. What's interesting is if you look at the map, you don't see a lot of blue. So that's something that kind of comes out at me right away is there aren't many lakes that are cooling. There's a few. Um, the other thing that, that jumps out at me is that there's a lot of variation. It's incredible. You would think lakes all in the same region 
would be responding the same way to changes in, in our climate. But you can have lakes cooling right next to lakes that are warming. Uh, or you can have a really fast warming lake next to one that's not warming so fast. So it becomes very interesting. Why are these patterns, you know, why, why are these patterns as they are? The overall pattern, though, when we looked across all of our lakes, is that they were warming at 0.34 degrees Celsius per decade. And why that's important is if you look at the ocean surface, that's been warming at 0.12 degrees Celsius. When you look at air temperature, that's 0.25. So why the heck would lakes be warming uh, faster than both of those things? Um, it doesn't seem to make sense, but it's also alarming that they would be warming more rapidly than the surrounding air or the ocean surface. So we looked a little bit into that and tried to determine why would lakes be warming so quickly. So one of the big reasons uh, lakes were warming so quickly, we think, is that a lot of lakes are losing ice cover. So the lakes that were warming fastest were northern lakes, lakes that had uh, reduced season of ice cover, reduced ice cover lake, earlier ice out times in the spring. And what this means is that when you have uh, ice leave the lake earlier, it provides a longer period for the air and the sun to warm the surface of the lake during the summer. So eventually the, the surface of the water will get up to a much higher temperature than it would have if it had remained ice covered. So when we looked at, just as a comparison, at the speeds of warming, ice covered lakes warmed about 0.48 degrees Celsius per decade and non-ice covered lakes warmed at 0.25. So there's a, a big difference when you can compare them. And so how do we explain these differences? Um, besides ice cover, there's also some other things that might explain differences in warming. This shows you air temperature trends across the world um, based on um, a climate data set uh, from the East Anglia University. And what it shows are, you know, if it's blue, that means the air temperatures have been cooling. If it's orange, they've been warming. And when you look at that, what jumps out at me again is not everywhere is warming at the same rate. There's a lot, a lot of uh, heterogeneity. There's a lot of variation. So if a lake's located here, where it's cold, cooling, it might respond differently than a lake that's located in some of these hot spots. So when we ran models, uh, statistical models, this is what came out as important, is how fast was the air temperature warming? That influenced how fast lakes were warming. And if you do a little plot of it, here's air temperature um, trends on the bottom, and here is um, air, uh, surface water trends. I guess we had a complicated acronym here, but basically this is surface water trends. And you see this line shows that as air temperature trends increase, that means the lake will increase faster. So you do see that relationship. So air temperature does influence lake temperature, and that isn't surprising. Some other things to think about, though, is you might not have thought of this, is cloud cover has changed over the decades. And people call this either global dimming or global brightening. And part of this uh, global dimming or global brightening is due to changes in cloud cover. And one of the drivers of cloud cover, believe it or not, are the aerosols that humans emit into the atmosphere. So if we burn incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and we release small particles into the air, those are aerosol particles. And they can form uh, nuclei to form clouds. So they can uh, for, you know, start a cloud, basically, all these little particles that we emit into the atmosphere. And what that means is places where um, aerosols were increasing might have increased cloud cover. Places where aerosols were decreasing might have decreased cloud cover. And when you look across the map between 1985 and 2009, most places have decreased cloud cover. On the left here, they're mostly orange. The increasing places are in blue. And the reason for that is that we actually put a lot of pollution control measures into effect during this time period. The time period before 1985 was really when we had a lot of industrialization. We emitted a lot of aerosols. 
And when things like the Clean Water Act in the United States came into, into being, or the, the Clean Water Agreement between the US and Canada, that's when you started getting less aerosols and less cloud cover. And the models told us if cloud cover decreased, then you got increased warming in the lake, because more sun was able to reach the lake's surface. So we had to think about cloud cover as well. Solar radiation is also another um, thing to think about. Solar radiation just is talking about how much sun is trans how much radiation is transferred from the sun to the surface of the lakes or the surface of the land. And believe it or not, it's not just clouds that influence it. There's other things like dust particles and moisture in the air that also f influence solar radiation. And what the models told us is places where solar radiation or the amount of energy reaching the surface was increasing, so were lake temperatures. So you can see it becomes incredibly complicated. It's not just one thing. It's not just air temperature. It's, is it an ice-covered lake? Is it, uh, are clouds increasing or decreasing? Are solar, solar radiation trends increasing or decreasing? So it becomes, you have to look at all of the factors together to really understand why lakes are warming at such different rates. And then finally, something you might think of is just the size or the shape of a lake. If you think of a deep lake versus a shallow lake, um, you know, which one would warm faster versus slower? And the, sh the shallow lakes tend to respond very quickly to changes in air temperature. The deeper lakes have been buffered quite a bit over time because they have large water volume. And so even though the surface might warm during the summers, there's still gonna be cool places down at the bottom of the lake. And so when we look at warming rates, we also need to think about what size and shape uh, is the lake itself. So just to kind of wrap all that up, if you think about lake warming, it really depended on location and morphology. Morphology just meaning is it deep, is it shallow, does it have a, is it a big lake, is it a small lake? And so we summarized it this way, we said fast warming lakes, they were ice covered lakes that were losing ice cover. They had increasing solar radiation getting to the surface of the lakes and they had less cloud cover over time. So you had to look at all those things and that's where you get your really fast warming lakes. The slower warming lakes, they're still warming, but they were non-ice covered lakes, so further south, and they had increasing air temperatures around them, and they had increasing solar radiation in the summer and the winter. So just as a way to understand you know, the world around us, why are the lakes responding as they are, um, that was what the study really tried to do. So some people might say, you know, not, not usually here in the Northwest Territories, but if I'm in southern Ontario and giving this talk, people might say, big deal, who cares? Lakes have increased a couple degrees Celsius over time. It's nicer for me to swim in the summer. You know, no big deal. Um, but there are, we expect some impacts of this. Um, and this picture shows a lake on Ellesmere Island um, that has been, uh, been a lake for several, uh, for millennia, basically. And John Small, um, a scientist at Queen's University, has studied this lake and he's taken uh, cores from the bottom of the lake. And using those cores, he's been able to show there have been organisms, aquatic organisms in those lakes for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now that the climate's changing, the lake is completely dried up. So it's not like this was an ephemeral lake that dries up every year or something like this. This was a system that existed for hundreds of years that is now gone. And he called this crossing the final ecological threshold. It's kind of the disappearance of a whole ecosystem. So this isn't likely to happen in big lakes, but a small shallow lake, you might expect that to occur. In some places, you get a combination of warming uh, with nutrients coming in, especially well-developed areas where you might get nutrients flushing off of farmland or urban areas. And models show that if you increase water temperatures, algae blooms tend to increase as well, especially toxic algae blooms. And so this is just showing an example. Um, I think this is Lake Erie, showing like if you were to fly over an airplane, what these algae blooms look like. Kind of, kind of beautiful, but 
also not something we want, right? They impact our water quality um, and, the, and the swimmability of our lakes. In some parts of the world, um, fish um, protein from lakes are a very important part of the diet, make up a large portion of uh, the diet for people living there. And so this is just uh, one of the African rift lakes as an example. What they found is as the temperature warms, the surface layers of the lake are getting very warm. And because of the physical properties of water, it means those lakes are more resistant to mixing. And when lakes mix, what happens is the nutrients from the bottom get brought up to the top. And that fuels plankton blooms that fish then eat those plankton. So it, it increases fish production. So in these systems where the lakes are warming, you're getting less mixing, that means there's less protein able to be caught. There's lower fish abundances in those systems. So it's also a food security issue as these lakes warm. And in some systems, um, this is a picture from the Salton Sea in the United States uh, showing a big fish kill. In some systems, as you increase temperature, um, oxygen becomes less able to dissolve in the water. So it's just a physical property of water. The cooler it is, the more oxygen can dissolve. As you warm it up, you get less oxygen. And if you have an algae bloom, the algae often use up oxygen as they decompose and you get these big fish kills. So the worry is that as we warm up our lakes, will a uh, phenomenon like this become more frequent? And then finally, in, in some places, especially where we are here, uh, there are organisms that have adapted to live in a cold environment. And uh, this is just an example of a lake I've worked on, Lake Baikal in Russia. They have the world's only freshwater seal. They call it the nerpa. And these organisms and most of the organisms in the lake have evolved to live in a cold environment. And so what happens when the, the temperatures increase? Will these organisms still be able to survive in those ecosystems? How will they adapt? So in Lake Baikal in the 1940s, you would have um, temperatures of about 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the water in the summers. Um, and now, it, they're in the mid-50s. So my uh, old advisor used to say the researchers would have a swimming competition every summer. And the competition was basically how long could you run and stand in the water. You know, and in the past, that was much harder because you'd go out in the freezing 40 degree water, you couldn't stand very long. Um, now that temperature's gone up a bit. So that's just a, you know, a way to think about how these temperatures are changing. And so since I'm uh, coming to the Northwest Territories in this area, I thought uh, I'd just look, point out some of the lakes we had in our data set. I have to say, I wish we had more Northwest Territories lakes. There were only four that we had um, in, our, in our big 250 lake data set. And the reason is um, either I don't know they exist or we couldn't find somebody that had these long time series. Uh, or the lakes were too small. So if you're going to use a satellite measurement, you need a big lake uh, because uh, there's only so much resolution on those satellites, at least the ones we were using. And so the big lakes that we have data for, they were satellite lakes where we measured changes in surface temperature. So Great Bear Lake, uh, Lac La Martre, probably um, screwing up that name, Great Slave Lake, and Caspa Lake. These were the four we had in our data set. So if any of you guys know of any data sets on lake temperature, anybody who's been collecting it, I would love to know um, because we'd love to add to this data set. But just to look at these ones, this just shows you uh, through time and then the temperature in each of these lakes. And this is, these are summer temperatures from July, August, and September. So each dot is an average for the summer. And so Lake La Martre, um, you can see this line, it's a fitted line from a statistical model. It shows it's increasing. Um, but in scientific world and statistical world, unless this P is less than 0 0.05, we don't consider it a true increase. So this P measures, is this increase real or is it just random noise kind of thing? And so it's not, it doesn't appear to be significantly increasing. 
Great Bear Lake, so far, there doesn't seem to be much change. It's kind of a flat line and the dots are everywhere. Great Slave looks a little bit more convincing, as if it's rising, but again, not significant. And Caspa was kind of all over the map. So the one uh, caveat or the one caution is that uh, although these look like long time series, they start back in 1985, there's a lot of natural variation. And we just don't have, I would love to be able to go back further in time. If we did, we might see different trends. We might see different slope of that line. So, so far we can't detect warming in these big Northwest Territories lakes. It's a little bit suggestive. Okay, and then uh, part two, I just wanted to briefly talk about um, some lake work I've been doing. I'm a, more of a biologist. That first part didn't really study biology at all. It more looked at physical characteristics of lakes. But I wanted to also talk a little bit about the biology of lakes as they warm. You might not know about Lake Baikal. Um, believe it or not, it's the world's oldest, deepest lake. It's located in Siberia, in Russia, so a very cold region. It's about uh, 53 uh, degrees latitude, so it's a little bit further south than we are here, uh, but it has very frigid winter temperatures because it's, con it's in the middle of the continent. Um, it's you know, ve very far away. You know, Russia's a huge country. It's uh, five time zones over from Moscow. Um, and it, has, it holds a fifth of the Earth's fresh water. So this is a, just an enormous lake, 25 million years old. Um, it's very deep, 1.6 kilometers deep. So very cool system. It's almost oceanic in its size and depth. And what's really neat about this lake is it has over 1,500 endemic species, meaning they're not found anywhere else on Earth. So if you wanted to see these species, you'd have to travel to Russia. And it has this cool food chain made up of these endemic species not found anywhere else. At the bottom are these diatoms. They're photosynthetic, so kind of like the base of the food chain. So they uh, capture energy from the sun, produce cells, these are eaten by an endemic copepod. Um, so you could see it moving by eye. Some people call them water fleas. They kind of jump around in the water. Uh, they, it's called epichura. Above that, there's a larger shrimp-like creature called macrohectopus that feeds on some of these plankton. And then as you go further up the food chain, there's fish. Uh, Comophorus makes up about 95% of the biomass, meaning if you were to weigh everything out, out in the lake, this makes up most of the weight. So it's a very important fish, and that feeds on these lower organisms. And then I mentioned earlier at the top, that's the freshwater seal, the NERPA, that depends on this food web to survive. So the question is, as if this lake is warming, what's going to happen to this food web? Can these animals adapt? And so what's amazing about this lake uh, and the reason I was interested in studying it is uh, we have Russian collaborators who have been going out to this lake for decades. And they sample through all seasons of the year, even through the cold Siberian winter. They'll go out on the ice. They maintain a hole in the ice to uh, collect data. And so they'll sample zooplankton, like that tiny epichura I talked about, phytoplankton, like those diatoms, those uh, little photosynthetic creatures. They measure water temperature. They'll measure chlorophyll A, which is a measure of algae in the water. Uh, how much chlorophyll is in the water tells you how much algae is there. And then they look at water transparency, something called secchi depth. And if you've never seen a secchi disk, it's basically a little disk that's white and black. And you sit over the side of the boat and you lower this disk until you just can't see it anymore. You pull it up, if you see it, and you let it down until you just can't see it. And then you look on your rope and say, oh, the secchi depth is 20 meters, because you dropped it 20 meters down. And it's kind of a, a weird instrument, but somebody created this 100 years ago as a way to measure clarity of the lake. Because if it's very turbid or cloudy, you won't be able to lower that disk very far. So secchi depth is a, a way to measure water transparency. So this is one of the Russian scientists. The people call it a family science project. It was started by her grandfather, 
who then passed it on to his father. So this has lasted over 60 years. And then her father passed it on to her, and they've kept this program going. And so when you're trying to look at environmental change, it's almost impossible to get data sets that span all of those years to, to look at. And so um, one of the questions we had is, is there evidence for climate change in this big, cold northern <coughs> lake? And what are the effects of them? Is it affecting those organisms in the lake? And so um, what we looked at is we said, well, if, if there is climate change, what would we expect? We would expect the water surface temperatures to increase. We would expect warm, loving zooplankton species to increase. The cold adapted species, those endemic species found nowhere else, they might decrease. And then water transparency might decrease. And the reason for that is as the climate warms, permafrost melts and it, it allows uh, nutrients to run into the lake. And so that could cause algae blooms, which would decrease transparency. So that could be climate change. The other question, is there signs of eutrophication? And eutrophication is just a fancy word for, um, are we adding more nutrients into the lake, causing more algae to grow, become more cloudy or more greenish, rather than nice, nice clear lake? So if it is eutrophying, you would expect more chlorophyll, meaning more algae. And you would expect when you drop that secchi disc, it's not going to be able to go down as far. So there's going to be a decrease in water transparency. So we thought, why don't we use some of this data that these Russian, our Russian collaborators had collected to look at these questions. And here are just some examples of zooplankton. People, I, I mean, I didn't know until I was in university and somebody showed me under a microscope, this is a zooplankton. You know, so a lot of people don't know. But if you swim in a lake, uh, step into a pond, they're going to be swimming all around you, microscopic little creatures, and you don't, don't really know about it. There's uh, three different kinds, we'd say, copepods that are kind of torpedo shaped. There's clodosterans. This one's called daphnia. You might have seen it if you ever took a biology class. And then the smallest ones are called rotifers. Really neat, but super tiny and hard to identify them. And so um, here's a map of Lake Baikal. Interesting thing about the lake, it's so big it has three basins. It has a north basin, a central basin in the middle, and then a southern basin. So there's kind of a shrinkage, you know, a, a closure between each basin. So they're considered separate areas of the lake. And for this uh, survey, we looked at samples that they had collected between 1977 and 2003. Uh, we'd like to get some more recent data, but we don't have access to it yet. But all of these points are places where they took a, a vessel out and they collected data every year over this time series. So pretty impressive. I don't think anywhere in North America we have a big lake like this that's as well sampled. And so they measured all of those things I already talked about um, previously. And so if we wanted to look at what happened, here's lake temperature over time, the little thermometer. And here's the red line going up. And you see all these letters, that's just the basin. So F, S is south basin, C is central, N is north. It doesn't really matter. But if you plot all of these over time, you see this increase in temperature. It's about two degrees for the whole lake over time. Remember I talked about chlorophyll, basically measuring the algae in the lake. That is also increasing over time significantly. And then the final thing was that secchi disc. And I remember I explained that to you. That's what it looks like there, just a little disc that you lower down. That has actually increased through time. And what that means is that uh, the clarity's increased. It could go lower. So when we have an increasing secchi depth, that's actually pretty interesting. It means the water's getting clearer through time, which wasn't what we expected. But when you look at this across the lake, Usually people go out and they sample one point and they say, this is what's happening in our lake. But it's incredible. When you look across the lake, there's different things happening all over the lake. And that's what these colors represent. So here's temperature. Some places it's increasing. Some places the blue, it's decreasing across the lake. If you summarize it across the lake, um, temperature increased significantly in, in the north and central basin, but not the south. 
Uh, chlorophyll as well, you can see there's a lot of variation. And uh, chlorophyll was only significant in the south basin down here, but it did increase at 67% of the station. So in other words, more algae in the water. And then on the right there, Secchi depth. Um, I mentioned already that it increased about a meter and a half, so probably about this much. You could lower it that much further into the lake. So it's pretty interesting. When we look at the living things, these zooplankton um, that I work with, here's that endemic, cold water loving copepod called Epichura. It didn't really change over time. We expected maybe it would decline as the lake warmed, but it doesn't seem to have. On the top right here, there's the cladocerans. These guys like warm water a little bit more. And you can see that they have increased slightly through time. And then on the bottom here, this is another copepod, but this one isn't endemic to the lake, and it prefers warm water. And you can see that increase through time. And if you look by station again, you, you get a surprising amount of differences. Some places, Epichur is increasing, all of the orange dots. Some places, it's decreasing. Same with Clodosterans and that Cyclops, Copepod. So Epichur did not change at 78%, so that cold water loving one didn't really change. And we think the reason for that might be that it's such a deep lake that even if the surface is warming, this cold water loving copepod might just dive down lower in the water column, at least for certain portions of its life cycle. And another way to look at it is just where their hot spots and cold spots of change. And for that uh, cold water loving copepod, the hot spot of change was in the north basin, the cold spot was in the central basin, so again, doing different things in different parts of the lake. And those warm water loving uh, cladocerans like Daphnia also had different patterns of change. So it's not a straightforward answer. But if I were to summarize it, you know, the first question I had, is climate change having the expected impacts in the lake? And if I colored something red, it means yes, it, it does have the expected impacts. Blue is maybe. And then the green is no. So we did find surface water temperature increasing. Um, so that suggests climate change impact. We did find warm water species increasing, like that Daphnia. But the endemic cold water loving Epichura didn't change significantly, maintained the same. So it didn't increase, so maybe that's something. And then finally, we expected water transparency to decrease. And it did the exact opposite. So that's a suggestion that it's not having that impact we expected. And the second question I had was, is eutrophication occurring? Are, are there more algae blooms in, occurring in the water? And the same colors, chlorophyll increased, but only modestly, so maybe. Uh, but water transparency actually increased. It was clear. So it's a bit of a mixture there. But overall, I would say we do see some impacts of climate change. And it's a, a very large, deep system. And it makes me think, what are the lessons we might learn for other northern lakes, especially lakes in northern Canada, like here in the Northwest Territories? If a big lake like this is being impacted, it's likely that a lot of them here are as well. We just haven't studied it very much. And then just finally, um, the reason I made this trip is you know, I, we did that study, we found northern lakes were warming rapidly, and I thought I'd love to come here in the Northwest Territories and study that. And so I had two kind of projects I would love to do. One is looking at how these zooplankton I talked about are changing in response to climate change. So the temperature warms, we get thaw slumping, we get increases in nutrients and salinity and other things. What does that mean for the resident copepod and clodosterin species here. And will we get southern species coming up and invading northern lakes? And same thing for the fish communities. We have a lot of cold water fish in the area, trout, burbot, for example. As we warm the temperature, what will that do to those cold water fish? Some of them need that cold water to reproduce, for example. 
And so will we lose some of them? Will they shift the ranges north? Uh, will we get southern species like walleye increasing in some areas? So I'm hoping to do these types of projects up here, and I'm just looking for feedback from people about, you know, is this something interesting or, or relevant um, for people in the Northwest Territories or not? Um, and just to end, I'd like to acknowledge, I mentioned that that Global Lake Temperature Project was a big one, a lot of people involved in it. Um, funding was provided by different organizations, National Science Foundation and National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in the United States. Um, and of course, this is uh, one of the ships the, the Russian, our Russian collaborators used to do those cruises and collect the data. And that's been going on, on over many decades. So I'd like to thank the captains, the crews, and all the taxonomists who sat at the microscope looking at these little creatures uh, over the many decades. Uh, so thanks a lot. Okay, thank you.